Edward VIII was the oldest son of King George V of Great Britain. Born in 1894, he became Prince of Wales in 1911 and became the most traveled and popular future king that England had ever had. But on one of his trips, the bachelor prince had met and fallen in love with Wallace Warfield Simpson. She was an American, she was a commoner, she was divorced and remarried, and on his behalf, falling in love with him, she was seeking a second divorce. Then, in early 1936, Edward's father died and Edward became king. He wanted to marry Wallace Simpson, but neither the people nor the Parliament of England could sanction such a marriage, nor did they trust her. So to avoid a constitutional crisis, Edward VIII, King of England and Wales and the still vast British Empire, set aside his crown and stepped down from the throne on December 11th, 1936. Six months later, he married Simpson, whom he always called the woman I love. What kind of love is it that will give up crown and throne, position and honor for the sake of someone far lower in public status, esteem, righteousness, and respect? Well, we could call that Christ-like love. For if Edward astounded the world when he gave up the throne out of love, all the more should the world be astounded to see the King of glory, the Son of God, give up his throne, position, and honor for the sake of the undeserving and sinful. If Edward is remembered with some respect because he gave up the crown for love, all the more should Jesus be worshipped with all respect because he humbled himself in the incarnation and on the cross. So this is the first week of our Christmas series. None of the messages this month will be taken from the gospel accounts of Christmas. All of them will be taken from the epistles, from Paul's letters or John's letters, from places where we are told why, why the Son was sent, why he came, and what his purpose and mission were. The series is called Christmas in the Epistles, and as I said, we'll start in one of the great incarnation passages of the New Testament, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. We'll see in this passage that in the incarnation, God the Son humbled himself and God the Father exalted him. He humbled himself in the incarnation. He humbled himself on the cross. But in the resurrection victory, he was exalted forever and worthy of worship. So let's read the whole passage. Then we'll look at how he humbled himself first in the incarnation. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul opened this letter to the Philippians with a prayer, then he gave an update on his ministry, and at the end of chapter 1, he began the main content of the letter by asking the Philippians to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He amplifies this by saying in chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. 
And so at this point, after that strong statement, Paul decides he wants to illustrate this selflessness, this humility, this looking out for the interests of others. And like some preachers, he apparently decides to use a hymn as his illustration. This may in fact have been a fragment of a hymn that the early church was already using for worship and doctrine. Or it could be a very poetic fragment of Paul's own thought. Either way, it's used to reinforce his theme by pointing his readers to the example, the amazing example of Jesus Christ. Have this mind in yourself, among yourselves, he says. He, he's referring this mind is the, the mental embrace of the humility and selflessness that he just described. Have this mind, which is yours, in Christ Jesus. You are to have this attitude because you are to have inherited it from your relationship with Jesus Christ. The New International Version, NIV, I think does a better job translating this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Your attitude of humility and selflessness should be the same as that of your Lord. And Paul launches into this great description of the incarnation and of the suffering of Jesus in order to reinforce his call to humility and selflessness for all believers. So he says, who, Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. The NIV again says, who, being in very nature God, the New American Standard says he existed in the form of God. So what is this telling us about Jesus? Is this speaking about his essence, what he was in very nature or essence, that he was God? Or is it speaking about his form, that he, he looked and behaved like God? The, the answer to the two questions is yes. The Greek word morphe expresses both essence and image. A, a morphe is a copy indistinguishable from the original, like the original through and through, and doing the same things, having the same function as the original. So if I wrote an expanded paraphrase, I would probably combine the choices made by the translators, who, having the very nature of God and existing in the very form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, that last phrase sounds in the English translations like Jesus might at one time have been yearning for full equality with God and, and thought about seizing that, but that's not what the Greek is implying. Rather, it implies that Christ possessed that equality and chose not to hang on to it. So, further amplification, Jesus, having the very nature of God, and existing in the very form of God, did not regard his being equal with God in glory and majesty as a prize or treasure to be held fast. In other words, Jesus embraced humility. He was willing to give up the perks of Godhood, unwilling to hang on to the majesty and glory that was rightfully his as God the Son. Instead, verse 7, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. The first phrase in this verse, he emptied himself or he made himself nothing, was the subject of a controversy that has now kind of grown old. But it revolved around the question, what did he empty himself of? Did he empty himself of godhood and become only a man? Or if not, what did he empty himself of? It's clear from the life and work of Jesus that he didn't empty himself of godhood, though he did at times limit his expression of deity. But he couldn't have emptied himself of godhood and still have been God. Don Carson in his commentary explains it this way. I don't know why he doesn't use a duck. But what he says is, an animal that waddles like a porcupine has the quills of a porcupine and in general has all the attributes of a porcupine is a porcupine. If you take away all the attributes of a porcupine, whatever you have left is not a porcupine. Likewise, 
If the Son is stripped of all the attributes of deity, it is difficult to say how he can be, in any meaningful sense, still deity. Let me, let me continue to quote Carson here because he says it so well. The, the expression, he emptied himself, far from meaning he emptied himself of something, is idiomatic for he gave up all his rights. NIV, he made himself nothing. Not literally nothing, of course, for then he would cease to exist. Rather, he abandoned his rights. He became a nobody. I, I love that little phrase from Carson. Jesus became a nobody. He divested himself of the glory and majesty and honor of Godhead and came down to a lowly birth and a lowly existence. He was a nobody. He took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. Being in very nature of God, he took the very nature of a servant. So just as a porcupine has certain attributes that make it a porcupine, so too a servant has certain attributes and attitudes that make him a servant. And the same way as one who is God has certain attributes and attitudes that make them God. So Jesus once had the attitudes and attributes and honors of God, but to them he added the attributes and attitudes and humiliation of a servant. He himself said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if you're following this, what we're saying is that there's a downward movement. God is coming down to our level. God the Son made himself a nobody, poured himself out, made himself nothing, became a slave, and was made in a human likeness. At Christmas, we celebrate, maybe more than anything else, what we celebrate at Christmas is this incarnation of God made man. I mean, that, that's what was happening at that moment when Mary encountered the angel and, and immediately encountered the Holy Spirit. That, that's what was happening in that manger of Bethlehem. God was made man, compressed into manhood, born in the likeness of man. Now, this doesn't mean that he just looked like a man, but that he was the same thing as a man. The Greek word translated likeness literally means the same thing. So he became the same thing as a man. He became a man. Or as the Apostle John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It was Charles Wesley who wrote, our God contracted to a span incomprehensibly made man. We cannot wrap our minds around this, folks. And more than that, because he made himself a nobody, he was born in obscurity, born in poverty, born without pomp, born without circumstance. I read someplace that even a star, an angel choir, and gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh were a poor exchange for the glories of the throne room of heaven. Few knew, and even fewer cared, about this one lowly birth. It's as if the President of the United States were to quietly quit and take a job as a greasy mechanic in a little shop off the main road. It's as if some honored intellectual or scientist were to leave his job and go full-time behind the counter at stop and go. Jesus made himself a nobody of no account. This was humility in action, worthy of our worship or they also of our imitation. If Jesus, being who he was, could do what he did and become who he became, how much more should we empty ourselves to serve others? And yet this was not the lowest point in his downward movement. Verse 8, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. This is, this is the climax, the high point of the low point. If it wasn't already humiliation enough to have become a man, this Jesus humbled himself even after becoming a man. 
Adam had lifted himself up to be like God. He had disobeyed. Jesus, the creator, lowered himself to the status of a creature, and he obeyed perfectly. He humbled himself. Soren Kierkegaard said of verse 8, Christ humbled himself not, he was humbled. There was no one in heaven or on earth or in the abyss that could humble him. He humbled himself. In every humiliation he suffered, it was absolutely necessary that he himself assent and confirm and submit to that humiliation. This, Kierkegaard says, is infinite superiority over suffering, but at the same time, this is also suffering infinitely more intense in every kind. Compared to every other man who ever lived, or ever would live, Jesus placed his actions totally and fully in the hands of another, totally in the hands of his father. And what was his father's will? That this first, this only perfect man, should die as if a sinner. Jesus was the only one whose slate was ever clean, whose record was ever flawless. He didn't need to die for his own sins, but he chose in obedience to die for ours. When the Father said, sacrifice yourself so that I might redeem a people, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. He demonstrated perfect obedience, obedience that took him all the way, Paul says, to a cross. That, that's the last downward step. Not only did he die, but he died as one accursed, shameful in both Roman and Jewish eyes. Carson again. Suppose you were to place as a central symbol in your church a collage glorifying Auschwitz, its starvation barracks, gas chambers, and crematoria. Wouldn't everybody be horrified? In the first century, the cross had something of that symbolic value. Scholars, he says, have gone through every instance of the word cross from the, that has come down to us from about the time of Jesus and shown how the words crucifixion and cross inevitably, invariably, evince or create horror for the readers. It was a horrible thing. In Rome, crucifixion could be used only for slaves, rebels, and anarchists. It was considered too cruel, too horrible for a Roman citizen, so shameful that the word itself was avoided in polite conversation. But here is Paul proclaiming boldly that the Lord Christ, whom we serve, made himself a nobody, became human, became a slave, and then humbled himself further by obeying the Heavenly Father and allowing himself to be killed in the odious, revolting death of a cross. The language, Carson says, is meant to shock us. Many have tried to capture the depth, the irony, the paradox of incarnational love. One of the first was St. Augustine, the great early church theologian. He says this, the word of the Father by whom all time was created, was made flesh, and was born in time for us. He, without whose divine permission no day completes its course, wished to have one day for his human birth. In the bosom of his father he existed before all the cycles of ages. Born of an earthly mother, he entered upon the course of years. The maker of man became man that he, ruler of the stars, might be nourished at the breast, that he, the bread, might be hungry, that he, the fountain, might thirst, that he, the light, might sleep, that he, the way, might be wearied by the journey, that he, the truth, might be accused by false witnesses, that he, the judge of the living and dead, might be tried by a mortal judge, that he, justice, might be condemned by the unjust, that he, discipline, might be scourged with whips, that he, the foundation, might be suspended on the cross, that courage might be weakened, that security might be wounded, that life might die. 
to endure these and similar indignities for us, unworthy creatures, he who existed as the Son of God before all ages, without a beginning, deigned to become the Son of Man in these recent years. He did this, although he who submitted to such great evils for our sake had done no evil, and although we, the recipients of so much good, had done nothing to merit these benefits. Isn't it right to worship the one who humbled himself in the incarnation? Isn't it right to worship the one who humbled himself on the cross? Isn't it right to worship the one who is then exalted by the Father? Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If the movement was downward on the first four verses, it's upward in these verses. In fact, the upward movement is a consequence of the humiliation. Verse 9 starts with, therefore, because of all that's gone before, therefore, God exalted him. It was because of his self-emptying, because of obedience, because of his death on the cross, that the Father raised him up. The implication is that God the Father valued highly what had been done. God highly approved of this self-sacrifice, highly approved of this death. Why? Because by it, Jesus redeemed for himself a people. God loved us so much that he thought it worthwhile, even wonderful, for his son to sacrifice himself on our behalf. God loved sinful, fallen people and longed for them to be redeemed from sin, to be forgiven, to be brought into fellowship with holiness. So the Father exalts the Son because the Son has done it. He has given himself in love for us. It's incredible. God exalted him thus to the highest place. Implied in that little phrase is first the resurrection and second the ascension. He, he could not have been exalted if he had not been first raised from death. The resurrection victory was in fact the first step in his exaltation. The ascension was the second step, exalted to the position of authority and honor at the right hand of his Father Almighty. Now, that's the way these phrases are used in the New Testament. So, so Paul says God raised him from the dead, exalted him to his own right hand, and then gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. When Paul says that God gave Jesus the name that is above every name, he's saying much more than that the Father renames him. In Hebrew and Greek, as we've heard so often, names are more than convenient labels. They, they describe the essential character. So what is meant here is that God assigns Jesus a name that reflects what he has achieved and acknowledges who he is. But even though in that sense, Jesus already has many names. In Isaiah 9, 6, the great Christmas text, we hear some of them. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But the name Paul has in mind is one that every tongue will someday confess, that Jesus is is Lord. Remember that Lord is the word that the Hebrew people used when they were talking about God's personal name, Yahweh. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. <laughs> All right, that is my name. I am Yahweh, the eternal one. But when that name was rendered in Greek, or the substitution of Lord was rendered in Greek, it was translated as Kyrios. And so now Paul is saying to us, Jesus is and will be recognized as Kyrios. Jesus is Lord in the same way that Yahweh is Lord. 
Jesus is recognized as having this same lordship, this same status with his father. Not that he didn't have it before the incarnation, but now he has it as the God-man, as the crucified and risen redeemer. You remember that it was for proclaiming the lordship of Jesus that the early church was often persecuted. Rome claimed Caesar as Lord, but the Christians knew that they could only bow the knee to one true Lord, the risen Christ, Jesus. Remember, God had said there, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. And he has not given his glory to another. He has given it to himself. He has given it to Jesus, to God the Son. Jesus himself said that all will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And someday every knee will bow and every tongue confess the truth that Jesus is Lord. Paul's alluding again to Isaiah. Now notice this. Isaiah says in chapter 45, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength to him shall come and be ashamed, all who are incensed against him. In the Lord all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. But if Isaiah's words apply to Jesus, as Paul implies and affirms here, then Jesus must be this same God. Only to God does every knee bow does every tongue confess. So Jesus is God in receiving this worship. Even so, Jesus is distinct from God the Father. It is God the Father who has exalted Jesus to the highest place. And the confession, Jesus is Lord, is to the glory of God the Father, Paul says. Two persons, Jesus Christ and the Father, are pointed to as God in this passage, but the Son eternally glorifies the Father, and the Father eternally exalts the Son. That's what the future looks like, folks. Now, the fact that every knee will bow cannot mean that everyone will be saved. I mean, even in the Isaiah 45 passage, although everyone confesses that in the Lord alone are righteousness and strength, and though everyone in that passage bows the knee, nevertheless, to him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. Not everyone bows out of happy worship. So also here in Philippians 2, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, but it does not follow that every tongue will confess out of happy submission. All of those in heaven, angels and archangels, angels who, who remain in heaven will gladly bow before him. All those on earth who have confessed his name will fall adoring in rightful worship on their knees. But those on earth who have never trusted him will still bow. He will place his implacable hand of judgment on their shoulders and force them to their knees. And even those lower than the earth, Satan and all his demons, will on that day be forced to confess that he is and has ever been their Lord, sovereign over even the false forces of evil as the omnipotent God. So we have a choice. Either we repent and confess him by faith as Lord now, or we confess him as Lord in shame and terror on that last day. Each of us can choose. Will you bow willingly now, or will you bow in shame later? Think for a few moments about what we've said. Jesus, to rescue you, humbled himself. Jesus was made a nobody in the incarnation. Jesus lived as a servant to rescue you. Jesus died a cruel and shameful death to rescue you. 
Jesus made that ultimate sacrifice, not only giving up his status as God, but taking on himself the wrath due our sin, taking our stain, our guilt, our punishment, so that we, undeserving sinners, might be redeemed. He lowered himself to rescue you. Will you not bow to him? God raised him up. God exalted him. Jesus is now Lord and worthy of worship. And for the same reasons that God exalted him, we ought to exalt him today in our hearts. It's because of the incarnation, because of being made man, because of his sinless life, because of his undeserved death, because of his substitution for us that we meet with him today in praise and honor and worship and thanksgiving. It's because he humbled himself, that he is exalted, raised up to life, raised up to the highest place in all the heavens. And yet we, with him, his redeemed, his rescued, his beloved, will also be raised up. Isn't this a reason to celebrate? I mean, when we celebrate communion together in a few minutes, will we not remember this thing, this humiliation, this Exaltation. Edward VIII laid aside his crown because he loved one woman, a woman who in the eyes of the world did not deserve his love. Jesus laid aside his crown because he loved us and we did not deserve his love. He laid it aside. He laid out his life he poured himself out for those who didn't deserve it, but who he lovingly rescued anyway. Joseph Bailey, an author and evangelist some years ago, wrote this prayer with which I close. Praise God for Christmas. Praise him for the incarnation, for the word made flesh. I will not sing of shepherds watching flocks on frosty nights, or even angel choristers. I will not sing of a stable, barren Bethlehem, or lowing oxen, wise men trailing the star with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Tonight, that I, I will sing praise to the Father who stood on heaven's threshold and said farewell to his son as he stepped across the stars to Bethlehem and Jerusalem, to the manger and the cross. And I will sing praise to the infinite, eternal Son who became a most, most finite, a baby who would one day be executed for my crime. Praise him in the heavens, Bailey says. Praise him in the stable. Praise him in my heart. 